Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Mon nom est Pierre Normand et je suis le vice-président relations extérieures et communications à la Fondation. Uh, Pierre Normand, and I'm vice president external relations and communications for the. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to Thanks. the 23rd annual public meeting of the Canada Foundation for Innovation, which also happens to be our very first virtual APM. Our event normally takes place in person in Ottawa. So this morning, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time from across the country. Now, a little bit of logistics here. Uh, translation will be available throughout the event. And uh, by default, the session is based on the language preference in your Zoom profile. However, it can be adjusted at any time by going to the interpretation button that you will find in the taskbar located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Le programme ce matin est en trois parties. Au cours de la première, nous présenterons les This morning's program is in three parts. In the first part, we'll present the results of the CFI activities. Nous commencerons by board of directors, in which she will present a few highlights from the previous fiscal year. Next, we will have a short visit video from CFI President and CEO, Dr. Rosanne O'Reilly Ranta, who will speak about some of our more recent activities and where the CFI is headed over the coming months. A short question period will follow these two presentations. Please make sure to use the Q&A button located in the taskbar at the bottom of your Zoom stream to submit your questions in the language of your choice and this can be done at any time throughout the program. In the second part of the program, we will welcome the Right Honorable David Johnston, Canada's 28th Governor General, and Dr. Catherine Girard, who is a professor of microbiology at the Université du Québec à Chicoutimi. They will discuss how Canadian innovation can offer hope as we continue to deal with the impacts of a global pandemic. There will be another opportunity for questions after the end of the panel discussion. Now, without any further delay, let's turn to the message from the chair of our board, Dr. Ingrid Pickering. Bonjour. My name is Ingrid Pickering and I am chair of the board of directors of the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Bienvenue à l'Assemblée publique annuelle de la Fondation canadienne pour l'innovation. I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from Saskatoon, which is on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis, and that the CFI offices in Ottawa are located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Ashinaabe Nation. Let me start by telling you a little bit about the Canada Foundation for Innovation. La FCI investit dans les équipements et les installations dont les chercheurs et les chercheuses ont besoin pour répondre aux enjeux actuels les plus urgents. The facilities that researchers need to respond to today's most pressing issues. Ces investissements comprennent les laboratoires de COVID-19 vaccine. They also support audio and video equipment for recording research subjects to help answer questions in the social sciences and humanities. And they include field equipment and even research vessels to help experts delve into environmental problems and climate change issues. The CFI was created by the Government of Canada in 1997. Since then, it has funded more than 11,000 research projects in universities, colleges and research hospitals across the country with investments of $8.3 billion. The CFI typically provides 40% of the funds for infrastructure projects, so provinces have been essential in helping leverage CFI contributions into a total investment of $19.9 billion. Ceci est une importante contribution à la recherche this is an important contribution to research, and I would even say an essential contribution. Researchers can make discoveries and innovate, leading to social, health, 
environmental and economic benefits that we all experience. Things like better medicines, cleaner air and water, more jobs, and a more competitive economy. We are proud of what the CFI has accomplished. Across all its activities, the CFI recognises that excellence in research can only be achieved when we have an equitable, diverse and inclusive research community that fosters a breadth of perspectives, skills and experiences. I would like to take a moment to share with you some of the what the CFI has achieved over its last fiscal year, which began April the 1st, 2019 and ended March the 31st of this year. You can also find more details in the CFI's annual report, which will be posted later today on innovation.ca. The year began by launching of a new $400 million competition of the CFI's flagship fund, the Innovation Fund. The results will be announced soon. In the last fiscal year, the CFI also invested more than $140 million in 540 research projects through both the John R. Evans Leaders Fund, which helps universities attract and retain talented researchers, and the College Industry Innovation Fund, which helps foster business innovation. The year ended with a stark example of why it is so critical to invest in and maintain cutting edge research infrastructure. As we began to feel the effect of the global pandemic and its impact on so many aspects of our lives, we found that Canadian laboratories were well equipped and ever ready to tackle the many questions that needed answering. In addition to critical research to find a vaccine and to develop other health interventions for the disease itself. Des experts on education ont offert de nouvelles options. Education experts offered new options for parents and school boards as they strive to adapt to the world of online learning. To help industry produce much needed medical supplies. Et des chercheurs et chercheuses en sciences sociales and researchers in the social sciences and psychology have found innovative ways to monitor the state of our mental health in difficult and stressful circumstances and to promote good practices. That these laboratories had been established and were ready to perform under the most urgent circumstances is a stark reminder that Canada is a country that knows the importance of supporting research and using it to guide, inform and confront global challenges. Thank you for listening. Je vous souhaite une bonne activité. Thank you, Dr. Pickering, for that excellent presentation. If you have questions for Dr. Pickering, she will be available after our second presentation this morning by CFI President and CEO, Dr. Roseanne O'Reilly Ranta. Now let's hear from Dr. Ranta. Bonjour, je suis Roseanne O'Reilly Ranta, Présidente Directrice Générale de la Fondation Canadienne pour l'Innovation. Hello, I'm uh, Roseanne O'Reilly Ranta, President and CEO of the Canada Foundation for Innovation. I'm pleased to introduce you to some of our current activities and our projects uh, on the horizon. This year, our main challenge was, of course, the unexpected and pandemic-induced remote working conditions. With uh, efficiency and enthusiasm. ...for the $400 million 2020 Innovation Fund competition. We moved rapidly to reconfigure 91 expert review panels, including 349 experts from 23 countries around the world to a virtual format. Our dedicated staff worked long hours into the night to compensate for the difference in time zones, and they were supported admirably by our IT team. Everyone worked together to ensure the integrity and quality of the competition and the results were delivered on time to our board of directors. 
The Canada Foundation for Innovation was also pleased to be able to facilitate the deployment of staff working in CFI funded facilities to dedicate their time to COVID-19 research. In addition, we were able to make available $5 million to Vito Intervac for testing vaccines. We inaugurated two competitions through our Exceptional Opportunities Fund for universities and research hospitals, colleges, CEJA, and polytechnics. We wanted to facilitate the work of researchers who had turned their efforts and were reconfiguring their labs to work on COVID-19. The Government of Canada allowed us to offer $27 million in this competition and exceptionally waived the requirement to match the funds. This meant that the funds went more rapidly to the researchers and enabled the research to continue and progress more rapidly in support of our population. The competition awarded $27 million to 52 institutions. And among the projects that we supported were biobanks, research into the cardiovascular uh, results, uh, implications of COVID-19, uh, antipathogenic coatings that would make our facilities safer, and studies of the impact of isolation on our population, including international students who were suffering here in Canada. Nous avons beaucoup appris à cause de la pandémie et de par nos efforts. We have learned enormously from this pandemic and we can consider new model and try to work more virtually. We've also learned that we are quite capable of adapting to new models that will enable us to serve the scientific committee more effectively and also the country as a whole. Was the use of technology to communicate and we are going to have to put those lessons into action very soon. The Canada Foundation for Innovation and the European Union are sponsoring a joint conference here in Ottawa, except now it's here from Ottawa. The conference will be about international research infrastructure, usually of large size. It will be about the funding, the governments, and the measuring the work that's done and the impact on society. We hope that it's an opportunity for Canadian researchers to have excellent dialogues with their international counterparts. It should be an opportunity to show off the incredible infrastructure that we have across the country. And it should also be an opportunity to be ingenious in using technology. Uh, on est très reconnaissant de nos partenaires qui participent à l'élaboration de ce, ce congrès. Et nous disons merci surtout... That's of this international congress. And uh, we will be sharing some of this with our, our scientific experts. Ending March 31st, 2020. And before I do, I would like to start by saying happily and proudly that for the 23rd year in our 23 year existence, the CFI has been awarded a clean audit. And that is an excellent accomplishment. We are also pleased to announce that Ernst & Young have won a competitive bid process and will be our auditors for the next five years. Now, let us look at the financial results. What you have before you is called the Statement of Financial Position, but normally it's called the Balance Sheet. Our largest asset remain our investments. Currently, our investments stand at $202 million, and this is a slight increase over last year when they were $183 million. It is important, however, to remember that these funds are previously committed funds and are being drawn down accordingly. Now, if we take a look at the Statement of Operations, 
you will notice that our grants or disbursements to institutions stood at 360 million, which is a slight decrease from the 386 million of the previous year. On the expense side, our cost of operations for general and administrative expenses, excluding amortization, decreased slightly to 12.8 million from 13.2 million in the previous year. Operating expenses were lower due to a decrease in rent costs and prof professional services. Operating expenses fluctuate between 2.2 and 4.5% of our disbursements to institutions, and they've averaged 3.3% since the inception of the CFI. Depuis la création de la FCI, le gouvernement du Canada s'est engagé... Founding of the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the government has invested billions of dollars since since exemption. We have received a total of $6.12 billion. The difference, of course, will be dispersed over the next few years in accordance with the terms and conditions of the funding agreements and con contribution agreements. For fiscal 2019-20, the FCI, the CFI rather, has awarded $380 million for a cumulative amount of $8.3 billion. And if we uh, consider the multiplier effect of our investments, which takes into account 40% of the trans translation cost, this would amount to a total of $19.9 billion invested in research infrastructure. Thank you very much for your attention and your support. Merci de votre soutien et votre attention. Bonne journée. Successful meeting. Thank you, Dr. Ranta, for sharing with us your thoughts on the activities of the current fiscal year. Now, let's take a few questions about the activities of the CFI. If you have questions for Dr. Pickering or Dr. Ranta, please use the Q&A button located in the taskbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Je vous invite à utiliser le bouton questions réponses Q&A situé au bas de votre... The Q&A button that you find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. During the... Um, during the presentation, uh, and it's addressed uh, to Dr. Ranta, actually. Um, somebody's asking about the impact of the pandemic on the CFI budget, on the current budget, actually. Uh, they would like to find out uh, if uh, the, our budget has been affected by the pandemic. Um, well, our budget has certainly been affected by the pandemic. In one way, we spent a lot less money on travel. Uh, in another way, we spent more on technology. Uh, we are working very hard to keep a balanced budget and our expenses this year will be slightly less than they were the previous year. Thank you. I have another question here for uh, Dr. Pickering, actually, since it's related to the board of directors. And again, it's related to the pandemic. I guess it's the uh, it's a question of the day. Uh, what kind of impact had the pandemic on the activities of the board of directors and especially their ability to make funding decisions? Oh, that's a, a great question. Thank you so much. Um, like many organize, like all organizations worldwide, we, we've pivoted to, to working online and actually have managed to conduct our business uh, very efficiently. In fact, we, in order to uh, approve the funding for the Exceptional Opportunities Fund, which, you, which you've heard about from uh, Dr. Rinter, where we've actually met uh, for, for extra meetings in order to uh, approve those funds so that they can be released to the researchers and the institutions so that they can conduct that urgent COVID-19 research. Uh, but we do and we do miss the meeting in person. And the, the main me reason we miss that is the opportunity for us as a board to visit communities uh, and to meet with researchers, with the, uh, the faculty members and especially with the, the students who are engaged in the research and to hear about the outputs and impacts they have on the communities. Uh, so. When we can, we, we will indeed be, be meeting in person again. Thanks very much. Uh, merci pour cette très bonne question.
Thank you, Dr. Pickering. I'm still looking for questions coming from the audience. I'm going to give it a couple of seconds and then I'm going to do like we do at auctions. Yeah. Going once, going twice. Let's move on. Thank you for the questions. Um, now, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote panel. Dr. Catherine Girard is a professor of Catherine Girard, doctor et professeur. Where she investigates the microbial ecology of the changing Arctic. Sa recherche vise à comprendre comment la fonte des glaciers et du permafrost. Her research is aimed at understanding how the melting of glaciers and permafrost can release microbes into the environment and how they are dispersed in transitional environments and further, their impact on the resources needed to northerners. In our work and helps early career researchers build meaningful relationships with indigenous partners. Elle est également membre du conseil d'administration de l'association francophone pour le savoir. She's also a director of uh, the Association of Francophones for Knowledge. Welcome. Was our country's 20th governor general Prior to his installation as Governor General, Mr. Johnston spent 45 years as a professor of law and served as president of the University of Waterloo for two terms and principal of McGill University for three terms. Il a également été président de l'Association des Universités et Collèges du Canada, aujourd'hui Université Canada. He's uh, the chair of the Association of Universities and Colleges in Canada and the author on topics including innovation, public service, and Canadian history. Welcome, Mr. Johnston. Merci, Pierre. It's a grand plaisir de vous être parmi vous. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Pierre. It's a pleasure to be here. Maintenant, pour Dr. Dr. Ranta. Thank you so much, Pierre. Merci, Pierre. And welcome to all of you. This is such a treat to have two of the most innovative examples in the country before our very eyes. Uh, David Johnson, um, you know, nobody else in the world has written so many books and had such an incredible career as you. But the books include um, talks about an ingenious nation, about what makes this country special, about innovation. So with this topic, you are the natural person for it. And Catherine, at the beginning of her career, has already reached out and not just been a classroom student, but has organized 12, approximately 12 trips to the Arctic research trips. And she's even gone down to Texas to study the biome in the honeybees. She's been innovative, looking about how the environment and health cross each other. And this is true innovation for research. So I thank you both for being here and for being part of this discussion. And as we talk about life these days, the pandemic always is the beginning of the conversation. And we read every day in the newspapers that we should concentrate on the economy as we plan Canada's recovery from the pandemic. Um, and as we look at our country, it's a vast country with many, many natural resources. And I think the very best resource that we have is people, um, not just you both, but the entire country is filled with diverse, a remarkable population. Uh, David, could you say something about how diversity is a strength and how perhaps bringing people together might generate innovation? First of all, Roseanne, I want to offer you a, a, a huge thank you for this invitation to be among you uh, today. I, I'm very pleased for two for, for two reasons. I greatly admire the Canada Foundation for Invasion. 23 years as a major establishment and institution in Canada, promoting innovation and research in Canada. Secondly, I have a personal passion for innovation and science. Alors, il fait plaisir de n'en parler aujourd'hui. Vous avez mentioned my legal treatises of which there are numbers and I can assure any of your audience that if you have friends who have difficulty sleeping one page from any one of those books will do the trick marvelously. 
Diversity and uh, inclusivity, you know, they're two different concepts. And uh, the key, of course, is to move from diversity, which is simply a status, uh, a static um, recording of uh, the heterogeneity of a particular population or a structure. It's the inclusivity, which is the action verb, that's is really key. key. Uh, Deloitte has done a study of um, major business enterprises and not-for-profit enterprises. Um, and it shows that um, those enterprises, particularly business that are capable of moving from diversity to true inclusivity uh, are more profitable significantly, recruit and retain talent much more effectively, and most important of all, are more innovative because of the broader embrace of ideas. And they title their study uh, from, um, from um, optics to outcomes, the optics being uh, diversity, the outcomes being the inclusivity. And when we we're in Rideau Hall, one of the events that um, Sharon and I really enjoyed most was the Winter Diplomats Party. The Governor General has the wonderful responsibility of receiving new incoming ambassadors to present their letters of credence. And once accepted, they begin to function. We'd have one or two ceremonies each month to be sure that they were not kept waiting. And I'd always have a little private time with each of the ambassadors. And I would say in my informal comments to them, if you attend one event this year, come to the winter party at Rideau Hall in February. And they would. And we would have them skating on what we claim was the oldest skating rink in North America. Ice on it five months a year because we have actually, with a donation, of an artificial ice plant that uh, makes the ice. Um, so these people have never skated before. We've learned to skate thanks to the Minto Skating Club. And if there was enough snow, we'd have sleigh rides. And then we'd invite them in for a habitant uh, dinner, supper, uh, and they would square dance. And um, the slogan that came from that is not sufficient to invite someone to the dance. You invite them to dance. Invitation to the dance is one thing. Invitation to dance is another thing. And we would have these diplomats from all over the world in a square dance. And of course, that's a very inclusive thing. We had a fiddling group from Manawaki that would call out the instructions in French and in English. They would be learning French as well as their English. And it was a wonderful example of inclusivity. And I cannot tell you how many um, emails and other photos I see going back to um, countries of origin of these diplomats saying what an inclusive country Canada is. And that really pictured it for me. Let me just add one other story about um, the importance of, uh, of uh, moving from uh, outcomes to optics. And I would say ownership. And, and that is that you, to really take advantage of inclusivity, it is encouraging the participation with the particular background and the differences that the broad spectrum of people in the group can in fact present. And so the idea is to encourage people uh, to draw upon their own unique traditions um, and put them forward for a kind of synthesis that is much more effective in moving forward. That's really wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, et Catherine, il y a des différentes façons de savoir. Catherine, et, um, si on est... ways of knowing. And if we want to be inclusive, we have to follow up on these various uh, ways or means of learning. Do you think that this would contribute to an improvement in uh, the quality of our lives, not only economically, but perhaps our health and our, well, our, our social existence in this very fragile time? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Roseanne and, and, and David. Uh, this up, thank you for the opportunity. To, to be among you, it's, uh, it's an honor for me to be here. We has to include the acknowledgement and the recognition that there are multiple ways of knowing. Um, as David so eloquently put it, it's not enough to invite someone to the dance, they must also be invited to dance. And I think that um, inviting someone to dance and acknowledging these differences in, in knowledge systems and ways of knowing also involves recognizing that there are different ways that we can measure success. Um, we have to be willing to, to listen and hear how different, uh, what, what actually is a successful uh, innovation, what is successful research. And to me, um, that is 
absolutely uh, unequivocally necessary. It absolutely involves having partners from diverse perspectives and including multiple partners. So in my experience, I'm a, mostly an Arctic researcher. I spend a couple of weeks to a month every year in the Arctic with uh, on these in these remote field camps with uh, partners from the north, partners from the south. And uh, as, uh, as an environmental researcher, we try to understand what is happening to our environment, how climate warming is changing uh, the environment around us. But as anyone who's worked on the field knows, uh, things very quickly go sideways in the Arctic or on the field. And that is part of innovation, trying to figure out creative ways on the fly with limited resources on how we can solve these problems. And that wouldn't be possible for me in my work if it, I were only part of uh, Southern academic research teams. We need differences in perspectives. And um, I think another example for me of, of different ways of measuring success and how it can lead to innovation happened to me uh, early on in the pandemic. So during the first wave of, um, of this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, research was uh, stopped while we were figuring out how we could move forward safely. Uh, academic research uh, had been halted and we uh, got a call, some colleagues of mine from Université Laval and I, we got a call from our First Nations and Inuit partners in the Arctic who mentioned that they were worried and they were worried about snow geese that were migrating north in the next couple of weeks because at that time, uh, snow geese had been wintering in uh, the state of New York, which at that moment was the global hotspot for COVID-19. Now, there, there wasn't any evidence that the disease could be carried by birds, but uh, that doesn't matter. There, we couldn't rule it out conclusively, and our northern partners were worried about it. Um, and so their measure of what was important, what was a success, was very important in this context. And uh, our limited resources and these difficult times led to an absolutely innovative project. In a matter of weeks, we were able to put together a brand new sampling protocol to safely handle the birds, to test our team members, to rapidly confirm that uh, hundreds of birds were COVID negative. And for me, it was my first experience in, in my career of being able to get a call from Northern Indigenous partners saying, hey, this is a question that is important to us. And within a month, we were able to return a response to them. So I think that understanding that there are different measures of what a successful innovation is, is really important and goes hand in hand with inclusivity. Roseanne, as I listen to uh, Catherine's uh, wonderful presentation, there are two slogans that run through my mind that uh, often come to the fore when we, we think about looking at things differently. One is uh, to know one is to know none. And the other is uh, a little corny, but it's good. Uh, minds like parachutes work best when open. <laughs> Very good. Um, I was going to ask you a little bit about building parachutes. You know, you have written books about um, what an ingenious and innovative nation we have, but you've done more than that. You've created the at the Rideau Hall Foundation um, the opportunity for young people to learn innovation and to hone their skills at being innovative. Um, how important is that? And can you tell us a little bit about your desire to take what is a tradition in this country and ensure its future. Let me make a couple of comments, Roseanne. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, first of all, I guess the Rideau Hall Foundation um, emerged out of uh, my installation address uh, when I was appointed Governor General in October of 2010, and that was called a, a smart and caring nation, a call to service. And both those adjectives are important, smart and caring. And the call to service, of course, is uh, the responsibility and early on in um, our tenure, um, we concluded that uh, it, the Office of the Governor General is a very traditional office, but it is there to reinforce fundamental qualities of uh, citizenship and civic virtue in the country. And we decided we would use a foundation to establish the collaboration and networking across the country. Um, and um, one of the themes of that was innovation. And we actually wrote a couple of books and I'll comment on those in a moment. But I want to give a little bit of a preamble on the collaborative nature of, uh, of innovation. And it comes from Tom Friedman in his last book, looking at um, really the consequences of the digital revolution and, and before the pandemic struck us. Um, he was 
in giving a prescription saying, you know, education is so key um, and focusing on our young and how they look at the world is so key. And yes, the three R's are really important, reading, writing, arithmetic. But he said the four C's are of uh, him of a new importance and, and they are, uh, they are uh, creativity, their curiosity, their collaboration and uh, their coding. Uh, and I'm writing a book on innovation um, with my great friend, Tom Jenkins, who was then the chair of the National Research Council. Tom and I, argued, we agreed on the first three, but we, we argued a bit about the fourth. He was a techie, built the company OpenText, which put the Oxford English Dictionary online, a spinoff out of the University of Waterloo, later became the search engine for Yahoo and Google and so on, and great things that emerged largely from south of the border rather than here, but nevertheless, a great... Canadian innovation. And, and I said, you know, coding, that's kind of a language, Tom, and that's a technical skill. Um, that's really not fundamental. I've actually changed my mind. And I think Tom is right that uh, Tom Jenkins and Tom Friedman are right. And that one of the reasons we want young people to be understanding of coding is it's a new way of thinking. And it's not just arming a machine. It's an approach to logic that is very, very helpful. So those four C's, I think, are important to us. But the C that's even more important to me is curiosity. And what you want to do, especially with young people, is emphasize the focus on that question of why. And when your children or grandchildren keep asking why, they don't go in and play, respond to those questions and help them to answer the why themselves. If you get that, you get well. One of the things we do at the, uh, the Reno Hall Foundation, Roseanne, is uh, under the innovation pillar is uh, we um, have a, uh, partnership with Edelman Trust, who do the um, indices on trust uh, each year, which are helpful for another book we will call Trust. Uh, and they look at how the culture of innovation in Canada is going up or down. The good news is that um, in our most recent survey before the pandemic, uh, about 80% of respondents says innovation is uh, important but difficult and should be very much done and then about 71% uh, concluded that um, uh, it is um, actually worth pursuing. Our dilemma is the other side of that. I think we believe in innovation, but we have much more difficulty in uh, putting it into effect. So stirring ourselves from our lethargy uh, with uh, Tom's insistence, um, we actually wrote a book um, which was intended to identify about a hundred Canadian innovators um, so that we could celebrate them and we could understand that Canada truly is a nation of innovation. We got to, to 100 very quickly, although we didn't have a database that existed with these things. We had to create one, which we did with the National Research Council. Um, and then we kept going and said, well, it'll come out in the 150th anniversary of Canada, 2017. So let's do 150. We got there pretty quickly. And we're really on a roll. And we got to 297 and the publisher said, we will not, cannot publish more than 300 in a book. So we did the 297 and then we created a website in which we would collect more of those uh, particular stories and that website is up and running. But then we were encouraged and we did a children's version of the book. And um, either the children's version in for primary schools or the adult vision for, for a, a larger a older audience, they're now in all the schools, libraries in the country and with a partnership with one of the faculties of education of one of the universities, we've developed over a thousand lesson plans for teachers to take these stories and put legs on them. And then we have some digital operatings through Desire to Learn, D2L, that great, again, a company that spun out of the University of Waterloo in, in Waterloo, uh, to, to put these things in digital form and then develop a, a whole set of curricula in and around how we teach innovation to young people. And I'll just finish this story by saying, you know, we've had so much fun in watching innovation taught in uh, schools. Tom and I were watching a grade three class um, in Kitchener, Waterloo on one occasion. And the projects the kids had in groups of three was to take Alexander Graham Bell's telephone invented in Canada and assume you were in the year 1885 and to draw the advertisement that the storekeeper who was trying to sell these new telephone devices would, would draw up to persuade people that your business or your home needed a telephone. And then a second project, again done in groups of three, these eight or nine or 10 year olds, was uh, write the owner's manual as to how you use this thing. Hello operator, hello operator, et cetera. It was absolutely fantastic and so creative to see those young people. So 
you know, engendering that curiosity and then having it directed to a positive result that improves the human condition, that is so attractive for young people and so much uh, so important to us. And I speak about my passion for innovation. John Evans was one of the great heroes in my lifetime. He was president of the University of Toronto when I was a young law professor there. And uh, I remember sitting with John one time and, he's, and I, we both enjoyed the game of hockey. He said, you know, David, if we could only get people caring about um, as much about research as they do about hockey in this country, we'd have the problem. Like I said, John, that's a bridge too far, but let's not give up. Let's try working to make it just as popular as hockey. That's wonderful. Um, now, when I think about uh, uh, what we try and do sometimes in um, research and in academia uh, is cross disciplines. And we always say that, you know, when you bring, you know, it's like crossing the borders of countries, you learn a different way of thinking, you learn a different way of seeing things, and that it's in those interdisciplinary junctures that we're going to find true innovation. And uh, I think that it also, uh, those, those that coming together happens when there is a problem. You know, when, when there's a problem, people put aside their vanities and they, they try and work together to solve a problem. Uh, so uh, how, how do you feel like this, this uh, COVID-19 has affected us in, in a sense? Has it helped in a way um, remind us of the fact that we can and need to work together? And are there examples of good work that's been done? Um, Kathleen, uh, uh, est-ce qu'on pourrait euh, répondre peut-être? Oui, bien sûr. Je crois qu'il y, y a énormément de, de valeur et de, de, de positif. Yes, I think there's a lot, a lot of value uh, with the interdisciplinary research, obviously. Uh, it's um, lifting the curtain on a situation. Uh, before coming back to COVID-19 and this pandemic, uh, of course, uh, research on climate change in the north, for example, uh, we're talking about the uh, glacial melt, which are having an imp impact on global oceans and the world and the world as a whole. We often realize that there are other ways of looking at the consequences and results of these changes. Uh, global melting has not the same meaning in the north. Uh, Chalouette Cloutier, uh, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing. Ice is not part of the landscape. We're a life force. Donc dans ce uh, context, part of our training grounds. And in this context, uh, the loss of ice has a whole other meaning. And it's by understanding that that we can under understand the scale, scope of the problem. For la recherche COVID-19, tous les nouvelles que nous entendons depuis quelques semaines sur cette uh, uh, vague, et aussi sur l'arrivée uh, bientôt. In Canada, we're seeing collaboration from all universities, all institutions that um, participated in the most recent uh, CFI uh, Exceptional Funds competition. Um, I'm very grateful to be part of a group that was uh, funded at Université du Québec à Chicoutimi, where I, a microbiologist, and my colleagues, human geneticists, healthcare researchers, are uh, working together to... Um, trying to identify novel ways of looking at COVID-19. We're trying to figure out um, if we can find ways to identify people who are more susceptible to the disease before they ever catch it. So we're using microbiomes, so the bacteria that live on our bodies and in our bodies that protect us from disease. And we're trying to understand, are certain people more vulnerable to the disease? So that's a form of innovation that at our uh, institution, Université du Québec à Chicoutimi, we um, were able to get the infrastructure that we need to answer this new question. Uh, so interdisciplinary research is absolutely necessary, I think, to rise up to the big challenges that we're facing right now. And I think the global pandemic is certainly a big challenge that we have to tackle together. Um, David, Let's just do a riff on those thoughtful comments of Catherine. Uh, one is just a tribute to her important discipline and the cross-disciplinary work that she does. As Tom and I were writing the, the first innovation book, we were startled and shouldn't have been of the number of innovations that came from pre-European history Canada. Uh, I think of the North, for example, um, the kayak um, as a means of transportation. Um, the life jacket, in fact, was invented by Inuit people, seal hunting. Think of the number of lives it saved and 
around the world and the number of children have learned how to swim with life jackets, et cetera. The description of, of snow, um, I think there are something like 20 different definitions uh, in the Inuit language uh, to describe that. The wonderful, wonderful range of interpretations. Um, the um, igloo itself, uh, Buckminster Fuller later developed that into a very interesting engineering design with the pressures aligned in very interesting ways. Uh, at the Rita Hall Foundation, we have the privilege of administering the Arctic Inspiration Prize, which Catherine uh, has helped to promote so well. And it's a $60 million endowment, the yield from which provides support for innovative ventures in the North, ranging from education to culture to health, you name it. And another feature of, of celebrating that is uh, we started the Governor General Innovation Awards in 2016. And in the first round, a researcher from the University of Montreal who's developed a very sophisticated software system that will record the oral languages of uh, some of the different um, First Nations across the country, which are diminishing, uh, only known by a few elders. And by capturing the actual audio, uh, she has then be able to develop a, a written um, dictionary uh, and then a grammar lexicon about that particular language as a way of preserving it. She's actually an immigrant from Belgium, you know, one more example of the diversity of, uh, of this country. Uh, and those are all, you know, important, uh, important things that we learn uh, if our minds like parachutes are open, are open and gather from others. You know, I could go on about this and maybe just give me a chance to speak about uh, collaboration uh, and innovation in dealing with the pandemic. We're currently writing a book called Empathy, which is kind of a sequel to the book Trust. And empathy is not sympathy. Sympathy is, I feel sorry for your lot. Empathy is I'm going to do something about it. It's um, uh, I will walk in your shoes and we will walk together to improve your, your journey. But what, what you find is that um, you, um, you have to move from, from the me to we to the other to be able to see that journey. And of course, once you do, some very, very creative solutions occur. Um, you mentioned that we live in turbulent times with the pandemic. Uh, Peter Drucker once said, um, in turbulent times, our greatest danger is not turbulence, it's using yesterday's logic. And it requires a new logic. I tell to my business friends that are dealing with the pandemic, you know, the worst thing you can do is to circle the wagons and hunt, hunker down. Never has independent thinking been more important to your board, to your senior management, to your different parts of your organization um, than it is today, creative thinking. And that takes one to empathy, which is walking the other person's shoes. And when you do, that's a wonderful form of collaboration. That's absolutely fantastic, David. And it makes me, uh, reminds me that we're supposed to be asking, uh, accepting questions uh, from, the, uh, from the audience. Uh, so are there any questions from the audience? We'd love to hear them while we're, uh, while we're looking at this uh, uh, screen here. Um, are there questions coming up from the audience? I don't know, can you hear me? Uh, well, I have a question for Catherine, and that is uh, just a, a litmus test of the pandemic in the North, Catherine. What are you finding about, one, um, the differences in how that is impacting the North, and secondly, the kind of reactive, um, innovative ways that uh, Northern regions, each being different, uh, have responded to it? You mentioned well, Mogis. That's a, a great question and something that as a, a research community, uh, Arctic scientists have really had to reflect on recently. Um, I think that, well, this summer, obviously, uh, our usual field season were suspended. Uh, rightly so, because northern communities are very vulnerable to infectious disease and COVID-19. And there was a real desire to um, protect northern regions and the territories restricted terror uh, travel uh, significantly and rightly so and but now we're seeing all these uh, dramatic changes happening in the north um, COVID might be happening but climate change global transformations are not stopping and we saw for example the Milne ice shelf part of the one of the largest still intact ice shelves in the Canadian Arctic that collapsed uh, in August, uh, fields, one of my field sites that I uh, visit regularly. And so it's extremely worrisome. We're thinking, well, 
change is happening. We have to um, protect Canadians. We can't uh, travel all over the place. We have to be mindful of how we can prevent the spread of the pandemic, but how can we still be innovative and how can we still produce research? And um, je peux peut-être passer au français. Je crois que c'est une, une belle opportunité, en fait, pour Great la... opportunity for the research community to reflect on how we can improve our proper practices. For decades, we've been talking with our partners in the North, the Indigenous people. How can we, how can it be in the North, for the North, by the Northerners? This is what we're aiming at. Now, it was really hard not to go out on field trips this summer, but it was also an opportunity uh, to collaborate, uh, to delegate, to devolve, if you will, and to share power that we have with our Northern partners. Science stops for no man, and we can continue uh, cooperating with our partners. Uh, I, I, have, I have friends in the North who are super busy right now. They're continuing to, uh, to, to do sampling, uh, analyses, uh, in conjunction with a little bit of a, a hand up from the South. It was scary not to be able to visit our field sites, but we're seeing that it's not stopping us. We can and will actually endure and continue to produce innovative research. So um, when we look at how this uh, pandemic might have changed research in the North, um, one of the questions that we've got on the screen is, how has it changed? And a subset of that question is really, uh, we talk a lot about citizen scientists. And these days when scientists can't leave their labs, um, they need to involve citizens in collecting data and being on the ground eyes and ears. Um, has the pandemic and the difficulty to, in traveling added to the use of uh, citizen scientists in the North? Absolutely, certainly. And I think it's, it's a valuable, uh, thing we've learned because uh, it, throughout this pandemic, I think we've seen that uh, people, we need to engage with our fellow citizens to make them feel like they are also uh, involved in research and in the production and interpretation of science. And uh, we've seen certainly more Northern partners being involved and involved to a degree that they always should have been, actually. We're sort of catching up to what we should have been practicing for years and years. Um, I know uh, David has uh, visited the North many times and knows many people there, so I'm sure a lot of your acquaintances and people you know are also uh, coming together and, and contributing to science right now. What a privilege. David, you talk about serving and you talked about, you know, thinking differently uh, and, and you talked about collaborating and, and dancing together. Um, you have been a university president for many years, and there were, I'm sure, many crises that were perhaps not as universal as the pandemic, but crises that hit. Do you see, can you think of an example where um, people came together and worked together uh, to solve a problem and that it was really effective and that maybe collaboration is the way of the future? Oh, so many, Roseanne, I'm such a lucky guy. Um, I'm on a one year leave of absence from my law firm uh, for 56 years now. I was supposed to start my articles of indenture and asked to be relieved because the, the Dean of the Law School at Queens where I was uh, doing my last year uh, asked me to, to join. Uh, and I speak about the university, the cause and the company are very good. Uh, the cause, the idealism of improving the human condition are so good. Uh, the company just absolutely superb. Think of those students that come in each September and enliven you and make your life so great and so many dedicated colleagues. Uh, I guess the generalization I draw of dealing with crises or challenges is uh, you respond collaboratively. Um, you say we have a challenge, you know, budget cuts this year or this particular pandemic is affecting us so international students uh, diminish um, and uh, sending our students abroad is diminished. But what you do is you bring together uh, all of the affected people um, and uh, you present the, the issues um, as clearly and as fully as you can and collaboratively you come up with a solution and everybody won't be pleased but there's been a, a collective effort in, uh, in coming up with it and then um, the institution owns it. Um, you know, as we look at the difficulties in politics today, 
uh, we need a new Tea Party uh, that would operate on the uh, the notion of uh, truth, uh, trust, um, and um, and tolerance, um, and then action from that. And and that I think is the way you face uh, crises that you face them together. Um, you don't go like Moses to the top of the mountain, come back with 10 commandments, you kind of develop them from within. But I just want to, it's not quite that question of crises, but I, I just want to come back to Catherine's focus on the North and what we learn. Um, one of the, uh, the Arctic Inspiration Prize, the million dollar prize last year was uh, to uh, early childhood education, uh, where Canada has been a pioneer uh, working at how little kids, babies on learn and learn differently, et cetera, and how we use our new understanding of learning uh, to make the development of the child uh, so much uh, fuller, et cetera. So two young women in Pond Inlet, which is way up in the top of Boffin Island, uh, finished the schooling there, came down to Callaway to finish their high school, and then did the one year early childhood education uh, program at the community college in Callaway. And they went back to their village and they started the first early childhood education creche or nursery, taking little babies, I guess, from age one on up till six when they went on to regular school. Um, they had learned the Montessori method of teaching in early childhood education. And their program was one we teach in, in the Inuit language so that babies learn in the language of their birth. Uh, number two, they use the Montessori method, which is about curiosity and self-learning. And number three, we involve the community uh, and their skills, et cetera, in the early education of these children. The million dollars helped them to establish um, a second uh, center for early childhood education in Iqaluit, again, using two or three graduates of the community college. And then it was to extend that program across the 23 or 25 hamlets or villages in Nunavut. And I hope the next leg of that will be to extend that early childhood education in the first language using the curiosity method and using the local environment to learn, to realize the most important thing we do with children is to help them learn how to learn. So that was a startling and wonderful, wonderful development. I just wanna mention one other of the Governor General Innovation Awards because it is um, in a sense a response to a crisis and the crisis is climate change and it shows how great Canadians are at collaborating in uh, interdisciplinary work. In the very first year, one of the six winners was Robert, was Jeff Dawes of um, Dalhousie University. Jeff's an engineer and he works on lithium ion batteries. And he has done so for about 30 years where they first came into being. Essentially, it's to take a battery that stores energy and make it stronger, faster and longer and cheaper. Um, his first uh, uh, major support was, of course, uh, NSERC uh, and IRAP programs, and it was with 3M. Uh, more recently, he's also involved with Tesla uh, that does both cars and batteries, as well as space rockets. And he's the largest external research center uh, for their work. And last year, the Nobel Prize in um, chemistry was won by the two theoreticians of lithium ion batteries being improved. Well, Jeff should have been the third winner of that with them because while they were developing the theory, uh, he was developing the application. Um, it's a bit like Rutherford at McGill in the 1890s. Uh, he developed the theory of atomic fission um, and won the Nobel Prize when he went back to England for it. Um, but then many of the applications were here in Canada, including the cobalt uh, cancer treatment machine out of Saskatchewan back in the early 1950s. That's all of a riff to say, you know, we are innovators in this country. We are collaborators in this country. We're curious people and we've had to, to deal with the vast expanse, et cetera. Our challenge is to put it to work. I would love to thank you both for being so inspiring. Um, there's nobody that can listen to you and not want to go out and be creative and uh, innovative. And I thank you for challenging us because we have a great tradition of innovation in this country. And we have great people like the two of you to inspire us and make us all want to do more. So thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart and from all those who are listening to you. Thank you very much. Merci, merci. C'est vraiment grand plaisir, Roseanne. Merci beaucoup, Roseanne. Merci, David. Merci, Catherine. David, thank you, Catherine. Thank you all. And on that point, I'd like to join uh, 
uh, the thanks for having a very stimulating uh, conversation this morning. Here's this morning, uh, Dr. Pickering, Dr. Ranta, Dr. Ja, and of course, M Monsieur Johnston. If you would like to know more about the activities of the CFI over the past uh, fiscal year, please go to our, vets, our website where you can find our current annual report. The address of our website is, of course, innovation.ca. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude, officially conclude the 23rd annual public meeting of the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Thank you for joining us this morning. Merci d'avoir accepté notre invitation. Have a great day. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Have a great day.